So let me say welcome to you, brothers and sisters, for joining us for this, the fourth in the series of our study, um, Emerging from Lockdown. Those of you who have uh, had the um, privilege to be um, with us in the previous series, you know that um, there, were, there have been many uh, interesting and, and, and valued things that we have been able to share. And I'm looking forward to see what this evening's um, session will, will bring us. Um, I just want to alert someone to read for us um, the passage, which is going to be presented on the screen. It's going to be from Genesis 8, um, 18 to 22. And well, Roberta, if you would be in preparation to read that for us when we come to it, if you have the text, you can read from it. Or when I present it on the screen, you could read there for us. But before we begin, let us have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time again of study. Thank you for those who are able to be with us to reflect together on the word of God. We are looking for guidance in our walk. And we are looking for um, strength for our walk. We are looking also for the assurance of your presence with us as we walk. And our gathering today is a way in which we can build one another up in the faith. We ask it and ask your leading now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So let us, so to speak, get the show on the road with the first in the, with the fourth in this uh, the final in this four-part series. Um, but for those of you who may have not had the chance to um, view the pr previous sessions, let me remind you of some of the things that we, we spoke about in the previous sessions. Um, just to remind you what we did in week one. Week one was uh, uh, where we discovered um, how how challenging it can be when we are emerging from a situation of lockdown. What we discovered then was that after the months of deluge and uh, heavy, heavy, heavy rains flooding the whole earth, according to the story, um, when all the deluge happened, um, came to an end, and and um, and the waters then began to. Uh, uh, when it came to an end, and even before the water started to recede, um, the, the people in the ark, Noah, discovered that they were resting on a mountain. And one of the things that we emphasized in that observation, that as in the case with our own crisis, um, as we looked at the um the situation coming out of lockdown as we looked on that situation um that like those people who were in that crisis in the ark we believe emerging from the lockdown we have the possibility of seeing things in a new way seeing things as if from a mountain seeing things as if um from a new perspective and what might it mean for you or me that we have come through this situation and now we are seeing things in a new way so that was week one week two we recognized as noah tried to get a sense of what was happening on the ground so to speak he he had a number of innovations he sent uh first of all a raven the raven did not return um he sent a dove well the dove eventually made three trips first trip the dove came back because there was no place to um, to place the the feet the second trip the dove um, brought a twig and handed it to noah noah read that as a sign that things were changing and it was so to speak an olive branch um, being given to um being, being, being given to him this is, in a sense was how he read it and um and and he saw in it 
things were changing, but even ever so slowly. The, 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 the dove was sent out a third time, and, uh, and this time the dove did not return. Um, and Noah, according to the text, concluded that there was a place for the dove to lay the feet. But what we did say, that these two birds being sent may well represent the kinds of approaches that individuals have in dealing with a crisis. Not everyone is quick to take advantage of the crisis. We call that the raven approach. Um, and not everyone is uh, keen to take on risk. Not everyone is adventurous. Not everyone can find their feet quickly in the new situation. Some people are raven, but some people are like the dove in that it's much more, much more deliberate, much more, uh, con uh, you know, much more maybe reflective, taking a longer time, so to speak, to find their feet and facing new situations, facing challenges. And uh, we raise the question, what kind of approach are you taking as you move out of the situation of crisis? Are you taking the Raven approach? Are you taking the Love approach? Um, um, through both those sessions um, and the subsequent one, individuals had very interesting um, additions to make an observation. And, um, and I, I'd be happy to pause just after we finish the third one that Brother Len, especially you had some good observations about what are some of the things that those, that aspect of the story she realized. I'd be very keen for you to remind us of some of the things that you would have also emphasized um, after this third one. So um, the, 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 the third week in a way was the week that we emphasized and recognized Mo, um, Noah's patience, how that Noah um, was deliberate in his waiting. And we see a whole waiting exercise. He, after he sent out the raven, he waited. He sent out the dove, he waited. He sent the dove again, he waited. He sent the dove again, he waited. And then after um, he discovered that the ground was dry, he waited again and uh, he waited some other time and one of the things we emphasize is how that so how that it, it how we discern the move that we ought to make how important it for us to 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 wait and how important it for us to to listen and we we raise the question about what move we might be making, what are the changes? What are the new circumstances into which we are gonna come? Are we, have we been waiting? Have we been discerning? What is it that the Lord is, is leading us to? We spoke about the Samuel factor saying, it is important that we listen, listen to what God might be saying to us in a, in a world where there are many noises. How do we filter out the word of God? How do we filter out the voice of God? as we come to the decision that we wanted to move. Brother Len, you want to just remind us of some of the things that you may have emphasized as we have come that far in the story before we come to um, the fourth part and then Roberta will read for us. Yes, I, I'm not quite sure of which aspect you're... you're, you're, you're well, just anything that you recall was important to emphasize. One of, one of the things that I have emphasized all the way through really is that um, it occurs to me that if the, um, the events that we've just gone through, the COVID-19, had occurred in um, what we would see as early biblical times, I'm sure that the pandemic would have been interpreted as an act of God, very much as, as such. As the flood was in this case, it was seen as being an act of God. And if that was the case, you know, we, 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 we began by asking, you know, where is God? And uh, I, I've emphasized, I think God knows exactly where we are. He knows all about the COVID-19. So there must be a purpose that he has in mind with regard to COVID-19. And um, the scripture reminds us that, that the flood occurred because of the, um, the sin of man. God lost his patience with, with mankind and sent the flood as a means of wiping out the past and beginning a new future. And my view of the uh, coming out of um, COVID 
we, we should be asking ourselves, what is God asking of us in this situation? Um, and should we be thinking in terms of where God is leading us as we come out of uh, uh, COVID? Th th there seems to be a mad rush to get back to where we were before, in the very beginning. But if where we were, if where we were at the beginning of the plot, of the um, COVID-19, and in God's view, it was not a good place, and does God really want us to get back to where we were then? Or is he trying to indicate there's an opportunity to move on to something where he wants us to be? So I think it's important we try to see this through the eyes of God and how God would view it and what he is trying to teach us through this uh, experience yeah. as we move out of uh, the... Thank you. Thank you very much, Brother Lynn. And that, that is indeed a, a very good transition to the session that we have this afternoon or this evening um, and what we may call um, the, the fourth um, uh, the fourth week and what happens as Noah, what, what did Noah do? I'm gonna invite Roberto if you'd be kind enough to, to read that for us. Yeah. All right, let's move my screen. Um, so Noah went out with his sons and his wife and his son's wives and every animal, every creeping thing and every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out of the ark by families. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of everything, every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing odour, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of humankind, for the inclination of the human heart is evil from youth, nor will I ever again destroy every, every living creature as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Thank you, thank you very much. And let me just remind everyone, um, while you're not speaking, just to mute your microphone so that we are not able to get the feedback because I cannot see well to manage it for everyone. So I invite you to, um, to do that if you don't mind. Well, it was when we looked at the store at the reading from Romans, we raised an issue relating to worship. And it may not surprise you that we come to the end of this four path series. And again, we are considering the issue of worship. Because in a way, I'd like you to I'd like to take you to verse 20, first of all, of uh, of the text and do a little backward um, retrospective look from verse 20 and then to look forward um, from verse 20. I want, to, I want to emphasize to begin with that uh, what essentially this, this fourth move, so to speak, or this fourth um, observation is about, is about Noah as someone who is at worship. Noah comes out of the ark and he's at worship. We'll come to that with a little bit more emphasis anymore, but there are different ways in which we see, a different way in which we see worship may be characterized, different approaches we might see, um, how, how different approaches that might be taken to worship. And in a way, the question that I would want us all this evening to consider is how are we uh, with our worship in the context of the pandemic as we are facing it. What is the nature of your worship? We have heard many individuals who have said that not having to go to um, the church building for worship has created for them many options in terms of where they can experience worship at home. And, um, and, and so in a sense, they are in the cocooning situation and they have the, uh, they have the comfort of being able to experience worship from the couches as they, as we, as we view worship um, on the on, on the internet mostly, but certainly also on on the on the um, 
on, on, on television or on radio. So there are possibilities. Now, however, as we realize that, you know, the situation with the pandemic is changing, I think it is important. And as a church, certainly our church has now given the starting gun, so to speak, that the churches can begin to consider reoccupying the building and using it for worship. So it raises again the, this, the central significance of worship. How is your worship today? How are you dealing with the issue of worship? So welcoming those who have joined us since we started, I just want to emphasize a number of things which I see in this text relevant for us to consider. And I want to see, emphasize, first of all, that the way in which Noah is approaching worship is that worship is a response to the situation. It's a response to the situation of the crisis as it is. He had been locked up in the ark for some period of time. Of course, he may well have had um, um, notions of, he would have had to have worshipped in a new way. It's not as if he, being in the ark, if we, under, if we take the story in how it would have been understood in this early context, it's not as if he would have put worship on pause. His usual form of worship would be sacrificial worship as we would come in a little while. Do we imagine, I mean, he certainly would be quite um, dangerous to be putting a fire in the ark. How did he deal with worship in the ark? It was worship in a new way. But his response as he comes out of the ark is a worshipful response. So worship is response. And this, is, I think, is such a very fundamental thing for us to appreciate in terms of what it is that we do when we, do, when we say we worship. It is a response to God. It's a response to what God has done. Does it mean that, that because there's a tragedy, does it mean that there is no justification or basis for worship? So what we see is a, an approach to worship in spite of the tragedy, because he has come through. And with all the, no doubt, the, 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 the death and the destruction that the thing has caused, does it mean that because there is death and destruction, there is not a basis for worship? Noah's response is a response to the crisis, but we also see that it was a response to the uncertainty which would have descended on the land as a result of the crisis. You remember now his sending out of the dove and the raven and his waiting and his uncertainty. So here he is and he is coming out now into the world, his feet. Remember, as we looked at last week, the Lord said to him, as if to say, you have been in the ark long enough, the Lord said to him, go out of the ark. It's time for you to move. So Noah's waiting may, may be seen as part of his own trying to discern, but also may, maybe he's his uncertainty. He does not know, know what is going to happen as he faces the situation. As we move into a new situation as post-pandemic, we do not know. Certainly, as Brother Len has tried to emphasize, it's a new world. The world is changing. And how are we going to be able to discern God's hand and God's presence in the new situation. Do we not say, in spite of the uncertainty, my heart exult and my heart want to return to God in worship? So it's a it's a it's a it's a response to the crisis. It's a response to the uncertainty, but in a way, it is a response to the new situation that he's facing. I do not know now where you are at in your lives. What is the new situation that you're facing? Is it a new job situation? Is it a new relationship situation? Is it a post-relationship situation? Is it a new work situation? Where, it's a, it's, it's a situation after an illness. Is it a situation, you, have you moved country? What is the new situation you have arrived in? Is it because you're now moving into the summer and so to speak, it's a new situation? What's the new situation as it is now? Certainly for all of us, this post-pandemic situation is new. We've never been in this pandemic and so we've never been in this post-pandemic situation. It is new. What is the response? And I believe that it is a 
timely thing and there's something that is deeply theological and theologically significant that one of the ways in which we mark the change is that we emphasize that worship worship as a gathered event it doesn't put so to speak to it doesn't undermine the value of the worship as we would do in our respective homes but it is is it not a way in which we together can show that the new situation as we are facing it it's worship so i want to say worship then is a response and a response that we make to god god who has made us he who has made us we make our response to him and for those people who have the shall i say maybe the confidence or maybe the temerity those who may have the um the boldness to say that they do not need god well it makes you wonder for what reason do you give thanks as in a situation like this and whom do you praise in a situation like this to whom praise is given when that we see um, that we have come out of a situation as this i want to think also of worship as transformation i want to apologize for the fact that um, there was a spelling error in the in the in the leaflet but i just realized as i as i as i consider this matter that you know this spelling error was interesting because the altar which Moses, which Noah built, was actually altering the situation. It was, a, it was a transforming thing. The landscape was transformed by the presence of the altar. It's a kind of an architectural um, change. And in this regard, um, we, we, we should not treat as insignificant the, the, the buildings and how buildings in and of themselves, in terms of their internal organization, and certainly in terms of their overall shape, how architecture can be a way in which we, 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 make, we, we, we make our worship to God be indicated. It is probably the case, uh, was the case more in the medieval time that there was, there was much more these magisterial buildings we come into modern times when there is a, a much more um, a simple, simpler form, simpler architecture, and whether or not it is not indicative of the kinds of approach that we might take to God. And, and so how can architecture, but certainly it's a response, it's a recognition that things are changing. The land is, has changed because the altar is on it. It does not look the same. It has disrupted. And I want you to see that worship as transformation, it is a kind of a disruption of the present. It puts on pause things as they have, and it creates a new possibility, a new vision, a new perspective. But that's not the only transformation that we should see. We should see transformation also in the family situation. The family has changed and, um, and, and, uh, you know, as Noah has come out of the ark, he and his family, they, they know that the situation has changed. It has changed for them. But, but also, we don't have to think long and hard to realize also that the land has changed. It's not the same. I wonder whether, as we see Mo, Noah moving out of the ark with his family and with the, with the animals, whether, in fact, we should not also say that for the animals, for the creation as a whole, things have changed. Romans 8.22 speaks of the creation groaning, waiting for its own liberation, waiting for its own change. And that beautiful song, Abide With Me, change and decay in all around I see. Worship is a way in which we change, or we indi indicate change in the situation. Let me introduce another thing relating to worship, and then I'll pause for your own comment, because I'm going to speak about worship as presentation, as offering, and then I will pause a little bit 
and hear what comments one or two might make as you consider this matter of worship as presentation. Look at um, uh, what happened as Noah built the ark. Yeah? He took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and he offered burnt offering. I don't want us to put the emphasis so much on the fact that it was the sacrifice of the animal. Indeed, that is important to note that it was but I do not want us to in that sense be um, diverted from the from maybe the greater point that he looked for an animal that would have been regarded as so um, he, he, he looked for an animal that was that was clean and in that regard um, he is uh, making effort to do his best in his offering the offering that he is making it's a personal offering but the fact that he had his family with him it was also a family offering so it's a family at worship and how important it is for us to not only regard the individual in the act of worship but the household or maybe the extended church as a family how do we worship together as a family which is a reason in a sense why um, re re gathering again in the in the in the in the buildings as we come out of lockdown why that is important because worship is not just personal Mer worship is also familial in it in the way it is offered worship as presentation but I want us then to see that worship is also about the offering of things, things being sacrificed, things being literally given up, things literally being burnt up. That is to say, being spent and the whatever kind of value the thing has, that is being used for the purpose of bringing praise and worship to God. We come to the matter of praise in a little bit, but whether it is the thing or the animal or whatever it is the the inherent value of the thing is being spent is being completely delivered for the purpose of giving praise to god so worship is not only if you like response worship is not only indicative of transformation and a changed heart and therefore things i used to do i do not do them anymore i know worship but worship is also about presentation of offering, personal, familial, we give all things. Let me pause there and hear what comment that um, you might have. Just unmute your microphone and comment either on that or on something else. Brother Len. Uh, we may have to unmute you. Let me try to unmute you first and then you can try. Oh, there you go now, Brother Len. You mentioned earlier about the, the worship before the ark and the, the worship during the ark. And we have no means of knowing how worship was defined in that period. Uh, maybe one of adoration, one of uh, subservience to God. But the interesting thing about the Noah story is that this is the very first incident within scripture of sacrificial offering. It's, this, is, this institutes a new idea into the, the whole of um, uh, Jewish scripture, the scripture as we know it. And it was, it, it's also mentioned the first time that the idea of clean and unclean uh, animals is mentioned. Um, and of course it's the choosing of the, the clean animals. And through that it's the association with the shedding of blood, blood being the uh, recognized as a source of life. So in, 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 uh, in offering a sacrifice, you're offering life, it's a, a life in some form or other. Uh, so this is the very first incidence 
in the Noah story where the idea of sacrifice as such is made. And it sets the pattern for the, the whole idea of sacrifice, which pervades throughout the whole of scripture, leading right up, right up to the um, Easter story and the sacrifice offered by uh, Jesus Christ as the substitute for the lamb, which had been um, the recognized uh, form of sacrifice in later scripture, later Old Testament scripture. So it's, I think it's important to, to, to realize that this is the very first incident in the whole of scripture where sacrifice as such is mentioned. And as you yourself have said, what that tends to mean is that by offering a sacrifice, it says to me that sacrifice is costly. You're offering something which is which costs something to to make. Um, whether it's the offering of um, an animal or the offering of self. So I think it's important then when we think about worship coming out of um, lockdown, we also bear in mind that idea of the you know the the sacrificial, the offering of oneself, the offering offering of something which is costly to God. Yes. Um, in response to is is um, is love for us. Yeah, and and on this question of cost, yes, uh, brother, and I think it is also important for us to consider those for whom the the pandemic has been most costly, um, because we have not all borne the cost and the consequences of it in the equal way. So that I think is another important thing, and whether in fact that is something about um, worship that we may we, we may have to think about. Let me see if there's another thought from someone else. Just unmute your microphone and make your comment. Um, so I think for me, what I'm not sure about is that um, when he was talking about the clean and unclean, mm -hmm. um, when he went into the hut, he went with uh, both male and female animal. Uh, I know they spent a period of a year there. So where did un the unclean and the clean animal came from? Yeah, that, that's a good question, Kemi. I mean, um, does it mean, for example, that there were animals taken in that were, 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 not, um, were not considered clean? And I think um, clean and unclean, in a sense, these are terminologies relating to um, worship practices. That is to say, those animals which were regarded as being um, worthy of being given to worship or animals that didn't have any defects, you know. So it could be that it's a sheep, and a sheep is normally a clean animal for worship, but if the sheep has a defect, then it would not be an animal that would be worthy, and in that sense, unclean, because you wouldn't want to give, to make as a sacrifice, an animal that has any kind of defect. So this is a sense in which, mm -hmm. in which we think of it. It, it, it. These are what you call liturgical um, expressions to refer to what is acceptable, um, quality um, within that context of um, sacrificial worship. Of course, it, it, so within the book of Levit Leviticus that we get the uh, spelling out of what is meant. Leviticus is a book of law and um, you know, a definition of clean and unclean. Uh, what is clean and unclean is spelled out in Leviticus. So we could read there if we wanted to have a clearer definition. But I find it interesting that when Moses went into the ark, he went in and took in with him the, all these animals and beasts to save them. as a means of saving them from the flood. Yes. But it's interesting that the very first thing he does when he comes out of the ark is to actually take the life <laughs> out of these animals. So, I mean, that, that's an indication of, you know, it is a, it's, it's an act of trust, if you like. Yeah. In, 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 um... right. Okay, uh, just one other comment and then we move on. Sorry, no, I was just going to say, just carrying on from what Len said and, 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 and what you said as well, Livy, about perhaps the effects have fallen on evenly um, in terms of the pandemic, you know, in, in terms of people's feeling, but what worship does in all of this and in terms of being, you know, in terms of a response to crisis transformation and a celebration, it's, it's a commitment to worship and the very fact that it's the first thing that happens sort of puts God very much in his rightful place as, as in that is where he's meant to be. He's meant to be at the head and that is what 
we're called to do is to worship in crisis and during crisis. And, you know, we've, we've seen stories and heard stories about how people have come to worship during crisis. Mm -hmm. But now that we come out of it is the real task ahead is will people continue to worship and put God in that place and not just mm -hmm. when in time of crisis, but indeed the, the commitment to worship now. Yes, now that's, a, that's a very good point that um, we, we yeah. sometimes seek God during the hard times, you know, so, and this, um, but will we find that the God of the mountain is also the God of the valley? As um, one 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 singer says, thank you for that point, point Roberta. Yeah. Well, may I? Okay, um, Velma, if you make your point, yes. we will. I, I'm going back to what you said about um, the the way this pandemic has affected different communities, mm -hmm. and I don't use the word um, B, the acronym B A M E lightly. So let us say. African, Caribbean, Africans as such. And um, what I find is that at this particular time, we know they've been adversely affected. And so looking at worship, thinking of this, many people would have had their faith tested at this particular time. So however much we're thinking of how people have prayed and they're looking to be worshiping and offering, we've got to remember that there are people right now who are questioning God, saying, you know, people are saying, why has this happened to my family? I've always done good. I've always, you know, um, worked, for want of a better term, within the law. And so people have had their faith tested. And I think it's important to take that on board right, right now as we speak as well. Yeah. You know, I, I, do, I do welcome that comment, um, Velma, that, um, uh, that the question of how faith is impacted by this pandemic and how, and how that um, the, the, the resilient are um, uh, probably the more resilient ones are the ones who have borne the cost in their families and their bodies in a, in a significant way and yet they have they have continued to hold faith even though with questions so um as uh, i know brother len is also want to say god is bold enough to take the questions that we might want to put put to him well let's 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 press on with the the final point that i want to make then i know that um, some people may have to be leaving shortly but um, worship as celebration. We, so we looked at worship as response. We looked at worship as um, as transformation. Uh, certainly indicates transformation. Worship as presentation, and now we have worship as celebration. And this is probably the sense in which we should see the language, the liturgical language, making reference to God, a, a pleasing odor um, going up to heaven. You know, so that it reminds us of the the parable Jesus told about how the angels rejoice when uh, the sinner in fact turns. So this idea of celebration, celebration in heaven, so that um, as worship is given, it is given in an act of celebration. It's an, you know, we, we, we should not forget that it is, it, there's a kind of a rejoicing that should be in our worship. That's the whole idea of praise. And uh, you know, let, our worship be, let our worship be about praise. And, um, and, and in, in that sense, we can, we can hear that the praise that we offer, the offering that we give, that there's a sense in which it, it causes rejoicing. It brings about celebration, divine celebration by the genuine offering that, that, that we bring. But there's another sense in which we should see the celebration and not to underestimate the importance of food and fellowship. Um, you know, the fact that the animals were killed um, you know, it's also part of the whole um, worship worship situation in the in the in the early in the Jewish communities where worship would have been offered in that way. It was also a time to share the food from the animal that would have been also whatever is given. It's also so it's 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 about it's about God, but it's also about the community. And indeed, we should say, if our worship is not pleasing to God. Or maybe to put it the other way, if our worship, it does not bring about a sense of joy and conviviality and celebration among us, what is it to God? So we should see that 
this celebration that we do when we worship, it's important as indicative what worship is about. And certainly I would emphasize the promise that God made in this story to, Abra to, to Noah, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter, day and night will not cease. That promise is being celebrated as well. So what are the promises? As, as you enter worship, as you would do with your family or extended family in the church, what are the promises of God that we're lifting up and say, dear God, for the promises that you have made, not a single one of these promises have fallen to the ground. And today we are here to lift you up in praise. Think about God's promises and his protection and his provision so that when we go, our heart cannot but give thanks. Worship is about our thanksgiving to God and our celebration. And it is not only the human beings in that sense who are involved in the worship, but there's a sense in which the whole creation is in the sense of exaltation. Isaiah 55 um, speaks of this, the, 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 the trees of the hills clapping their hands. The whole idea of the created and the uncreated order, the created things and the, and the, and the, and the living things and the things that have no life, being part of what? Giving praise. You know, Jesus in his story to the disciples was speaking to the disciples. He says, if the disciples will not praise him, then he's going to raise up stones to praise him. So there's a sense in which, you know, the praise of God can come from anywhere and anything can be an indication of praise and worship to God. So worship is celebration. And even amidst the crisis that we face that is real for us isn't it also a time in which we now celebrate we celebrate what god has done we celebrate what god has done through others thanksgiving don't forget those who have made the sacrifices let us bless god on account of them let us bless god so then Worship. Noah is a man of worship. He comes out of the ark. The first thing that he undertakes comes out of the crisis. And the first thing that occurs to him is worship. The, 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 if you like, the signal post pandemic response is a response of worship. And whether in fact we as church and as believers, followers of Christ may not indicate to the rest of the society, the kind of attitude that these things call for to recognize God. Can I make one final point? And that is in regard to Noah. I do not know whether you have a leading role. I suspect you might, all of us here might have leading roles in our homes. And what we see Noah as a leader in his family is that he is leading his family to worship and uh, in that regard he has um, you know he has a certain amount of authority and it's a question of how we might use our own authority um, and whether we set the example i think i think the saddest time um you know personally in my own life has been the times when i feel i felt that i didn't set the example certainly in terms of worship certainly in terms of attitude to God, because especially when others look on, example for worship. And what I would say to you, all of you, my dear brothers and sisters, as, a, as the word has come to me myself, as for me in my house, we will worship. We will worship God. Just bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, speaking through us through the crisis and helping us to understand that you're present with us in the crisis and you're with us after the crisis and as we begin to emerge we will not forget to worship you help us oh lord to put you in the place that you so deserve or to see you and observe in the place the place where they worship because this is what is the whole purpose of our being 
I pray that our brothers and sisters who are here this evening will make for themselves and their household worship as a response, worship as transformation, worship as presentation and worship as celebration. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.